I'm going to ask you to take your Bible and turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Today we're going to look at Colossians 1, 15 through 20 and talk about Jesus as that center, even as Zach mentioned, that we're building on these visions and values idea. And so I share with you that the first one last week is that Jesus has to be the center. He is uh, what church is about and the person that we listen to. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. But as a way to break that in, uh, I want to talk to you about something that I grew up doing. Okay, So when I was a kid, we watched wrestling. Okay, now you got to understand, there is wrestling, which is an Olympic sport, and there's wrestling, which is a men's soap opera that occurs in a boxing ring. Okay, you're familiar with this, right? WCW, and back then it was WWF, and then WWF bald, I don't know, and then it became all WWF, I'm not sure, WWE, I don't know what it is now. My dad still watches wrestling to this day, records it with YouTube TV so he can watch it again later. And so I grew up in the the boom of this, right? The 80s and 90s with Hulk Hogan and Sting and the macho man Randy Savage. Oh, yeah. That's right, Ric Flair. I'm not going to do that one, though. You want to you come up here and do that one? We'll let you. <laughs> right? Probably most of our young uh, students don't even know that The Rock was originally famous because of wrestling, not jungle movies. <laughs> okay? That was a good joke, okay? Right? Wrestling. And what happens at a wrestling match, right? Just like at a boxing match or whatever, is you have Michael Buffer or a ring announcer come out and he says, let me present to you the world heavyweight champion in the world. Undeniable, undefeated, da 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 And then he announces the name, right? Whoever is to come out. And we relish in those things because we think, wow, what prowess a person has. Whether it's in the pro wrestling world or a boxing ring or um, UFC or whatever it is today, right? We look at that and we're like, wow, how powerful that person is. They're the world heavyweight champion but I think sometimes we are under awed by Jesus because Jesus' power is not a display of raw might but of perfect wisdom and perfect uh, execution and only as it needs to be. So when Jesus walks the earth, he's God in the flesh. He can calm storms and heal the dead and make the lame to walk and the blind to see and the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. But he does so with such meekness and mildness, compassion and gentleness that we mistake Take those things for weakness. And sometimes we treat Jesus as if he's just another person. And certainly he is a friend and a comfort in time of troubles. He is the one who lifts the, the woman at the well, even though she's a, an adulteress up. Or the woman in John 7, right, who's about to be stoned, he lifts her up. Or the person who says to Peter, it's okay, right, I'm going to reinstate you. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. He is that person. But he's not merely meek and mild, warm and soft, tender and lowly. He is the heavyweight champion of everything. Wouldn't it be cool if Michael Buffer announced Jesus like that every Sunday at church? We might be actually excited to come and worship him. You see, the thing is, Jesus' power is on display every single day. 
The fact that you and I are able to sit here in this room at this moment is only because Jesus holds all the atoms of matter together by the force of his will. The fact that you and I can sit in this room as redeemed people, if we know him, is only because Jesus Christ came into the world, lived a perfect life, died on a cross in our place, rose from the dead to give us new life, the forgiveness of sins. That's power. And so we have to understand that if Jesus truly is, as we sang, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one at the center of it all, then that means something radical and fundamental for how we conduct our own lives, for how we do church, for how we, are, how we witness and our own mission, the kinds of stances we take on different issues and how we relate to other people. If Jesus is who the Bible says he is, then we don't get to put Jesus in the corner and just pull him out whenever we need him on Sunday or Wednesday or whenever life is going bad. If Jesus is truly that heavyweight champion, the most important person, then everything has to connect to him and relate back to him in such a way that he receives the honor, the glory, the magnificence that he is due. This is what Paul is going to do for us this morning in Colossians. He's going to remind us about who Jesus is, what he did, and how that relates to us as a church. And so this is what I want to cover this morning, this simple idea. Christ is supreme over all things because of who he is and because of what he has done. Now these two things go together. Who Jesus is and what he does are inextricably connected. He does what he does because of who he is. But what we see in the scripture is that Jesus is held out as this preeminent person because he is before all things. He's the one who made all things. He is God himself. The fullness of God dwells in him. But to prove to the rest of us that he actually is is who he says he is he comes in the world and actually demonstrates that same power in practical ways whether it's the healing of the sick or the raising of the dead all of these things prove that jesus christ actually is the god man the one to whom all things ought to point and all things ought to praise and of course the preeminent proof of this is the cross For no mere man can bridge the divide between a sinful world and a holy God. Only a person who is both God and man can bridge that gap. In fact, we talked about this quite a bit on Wednesday night. So if you miss Wednesday nights and our talk about the person of Christ, go back on Facebook and listen to those things. We talk about the significance of what happens in the person of Jesus, why he must be both fully God and fully man to accomplish redemption and reconciliation and the promise of resurrection for you and I. Well, This morning what we want to see is that Jesus truly is supreme over all things because of who he is and what he has done. In other words, if we're going to do church right, we have to know who Christ is. Right? We cannot do church right if we don't know who Christ is because he's the head of the church. And if we don't know what the head is like, then the rest of the body will not work well. We have to know who Jesus is and what he came to do and how that affects us so that we can actually live as the body from the life that the head gives us. In fact, what we're going to do is this morning we're going to talk about this as kind of an overarching category. And then later on in the year, I'm going to go back to the statements in John, the I am statements in John. And we're going to walk through those seven statements so that you can hear from Jesus' own mouth who he, he says he is, what he came to do, and how that impacts what we do as his people. Well, this morning we're going to give you that big overview from Colossians. So let's read here in Colossians. I'm actually going to start reading in verse 13, but we're really going to examine 15 through 20. So it says, For he rescued us, that means God the Father, rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. Right? It sounds a lot like uh, John 1 and a whole host of other passages, right? Where we were hostile to God, but God 
sent Jesus. Jesus came into the world and he is now giving us the right to become, the power to become the children of God, to be in God's kingdom rather than the kingdom of darkness and death and sin. In whom, that is in Jesus, we have redemption. The forgiveness of sins. This is that linchpin. There's but one thing that matters in all of life. Truly. And that is whether or not we know Jesus. That doesn't mean that other things aren't important. But if we have an awesome family and an awesome job and a great car and a wonderful house and we live our whole life but we don't have Jesus, then we will have experienced the best we could ever experience. You see, the person who doesn't know Jesus, this life is the best thing that will ever happen to them. But think of this. If you know Jesus, this life is the worst thing that will ever happen to you. And sometimes it's pretty good. But heaven's better. Think on that. Those people that live on your street that don't know Jesus, the best thing that they have is the best thing they will ever have if they don't know Jesus. If you don't tell them about Jesus... But the worst thing that could ever happen to you and I is this life because we have something better to look forward to because we have been redeemed, bought out of the slavery of sin and death and placed into God's kingdom by the forgiveness of sins that comes in the work of Christ. So he says, He, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body also, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness of, to dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross, of His cross, through Him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Now what we have to understand here is a little bit of context, both literary and um, historical. So what Paul has done up to this point is he's kind of given us this elongated theological primer as an introduction to the the book of Colossians. He begins in a pretty normal way. He identifies himself, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, who it's to, to the saints and brethren in Christ Jesus who are at Colossae, and so on and so forth. And he begins to give thanks for them through prayer. This is kind of Paul's normal way to begin a letter. He identifies himself, his recipient, and then he notes something about them or some way that he's praying for them. And then he gets into this section in uh, after what we just, uh, the section that we just read where he begins to lay some groundwork for what the nature of Christ is because he's beginning to uh, set up this foundation to attack the heresy that is upsetting the Colossians. So in Colossae, we appear to have a situation where there's kind of a weird uh, mixture of things that are attacking the church there, false teachings and false doctrines. On the one hand, you have kind of the, the Roman pagan world that is encouraging things like the worship of angels and, and a certain sense of fear that if we don't do these things, then, then we're, not, we're not really spiritual. We don't have everything that we need. And so Paul is going to talk about the fullness that is in Christ, that in Him you have everything that you need. But then on the other hand, you, you kind of have this Jewish element where there's an emphasis on days and laws and festivals and the Sabbath and all these things, a, a, a clearly legalistic type of thing. And the convergence of these things are upsetting the Colossians because they don't know what to do. They're living in an environment where, is Jesus enough? If he is, then I don't have to worship angels and be fearful in this context, but I also don't have to walk around wondering if I did enough for God to love me and save me. And so in the center of this, Paul puts this idea that Jesus is God himself. He came into the world to accomplish redemption. And in him you have everything that you need because you're in him. 
He is the one who made all things. He's the one who rescued all things. And if you have him, you have everything. So it is that if you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. And if you do have Jesus, you have everything. And if you have Jesus plus the blessings that he gives, then you have that plus gravy. You like that one? I love hamburgers and gravy. They're so good. It's like meat plus gravy. What's better than that? Right? You have everything in Jesus. That's why Peter will say, you have everything you need for life and godliness. You see, sometimes we get this idea that somehow in this world we lack something. Because we misunderstand what need is about. Now, there is no doubt that in order to continue physical life, we need food and clothes and shelter and things like this. What does Jesus say? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? Or again, right? you, you have given up nothing that you will not receive a hundredfold in the kingdom. This is why the apostles will walk around this earth and give themselves over to persecution and death. Because they know that that's not the final word. If Jesus is who he says he is, if he is the resurrection and the life, then the worst the world could do is kill you and you go to heaven. Which is all the better. Not that we seek death, but we seek to live for Christ, as Paul says in Philippians 1. So we have to understand. This is why I began talking to you at the beginning about Christ is your treasure. Because if you truly believe that Christ is your treasure, then everything else will fall into place. And if he's the treasure who's at the center of your life, then your life will be oriented properly. And we don't have to worship idols. We can instead give glory to God and make his name known. See, I'm trying to connect all these dots for you because if Jesus stands at the center of everything that we do, then everything receives its proper place. I can love my family well because I love Jesus better. I can work my job as unto the Lord because I love Jesus most. I can go across the street and talk to my neighbor because I know that I love Jesus and he loves them. This is why Jesus has to stand at the center. But the problem is, it's really easy for the focus to shift, sometimes to truly wicked things. But most of the time for those of us who've been in church for a little while, it's it's easier for it to shift to other good things. You see, sometimes what has to happen is not for the devil or our own flesh to lead us into the territory of the utterly wicked, but into the territory of the misplaced good. To take really good gifts and elevate them to the level of Jesus what he's supposed to occupy in our heart and life. And now what we've done is we look moral, but we're acting wickedly. Which is one of the greatest threats of all. This is the problem of the Pharisees. They're whitewashed tombs. On the outside they look great. But on the inside they're filled with death. This is what we are in danger of all the time. Not an outright heresy, although sometimes that's the case, but a subtle like misdirection. Just sliding off the center just enough to miss the point, to become ineffective. And so we have to always put Jesus back at the center. And so this is what Paul does. He's saying, look, you guys are, are getting off the mark. Some people are upsetting you. They're teaching the wrong things. Come back to Jesus. Come back to Christ. And so that's what he does here in this first little section. Is he kind of gives us this breakdown of Christ is preeminent over creation, natural creation, and also supernatural creation. So over creation and the church. Now there's a lot of talk about whether this section of scripture is a hymn. And the the theory goes, well Paul changes his language and vocabulary. And so he's picked up a hymn from some other source uh, early Christian source, and he's inserted it here. I don't know if that's true or not. A lot of these things are difficult to ascertain. I don't know why it couldn't be that Paul himself 
composed a hymn, if this is a hymn. What is definitely clear is that Paul's language here is much more direct than it is in other places. In, in before and after this, he has these big, long sentences, right? Paul does not like punctuation or breaking up sentences, okay? He would get an F in English class because he just, keep, it's like he writes and then he's like, oh yeah, this, oh yeah, this, oh yeah, this. He just adds it all up in one big thing. You're like, hold on, Paul. This is a really long sentence. But here in this section, he has a lot of verbs to tell us what Jesus is like and who he is and what he did. So it's, it's much more like uh, a machine gun rather than one big, long water hose of a sentence, okay? And so he gives us this idea. So whether this is a hymn or not, Paul clearly intends for it to be used in such a way that we understand that Christ, this nature of who he is and what he did, is important for how we understand our point. Now what's interesting is that this verse, which is what we often call high Christology, it's lifting up Christ and elevating his, his, our understanding of him, is one of the very verses that has been used to undercut his nature. Okay? There's an ancient heretic called uh, Arius, okay? and he came about in the 4th century, and he basically said, hey, uh, Jesus wasn't really God. He was the first created thing, and then he kind of became God or whatever. Right? This is picked up in our modern day by Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay? If they come to your house, they will tell you Jesus is the first creation of God. And they'll take you to John 1, and they'll take you to Colossians right here, because they insert extra words, which is strange, because they don't do that in Colossians 2, 9, which is probably the bigger verse that proves that Jesus actually is God himself. So the next time a Jehovah's Witness comes to your, your door, if they do, and you let them in, and they take you to Colossians 1, you're like, hey, can we turn the page over? Because this one right here says... And then they're going to be like, ah, uh, okay. So this is the nature of it. We live in a world where Jesus is threatened by many types of things, whether it's the ancient heresy or modern-day idolatry. Jesus is shifted off the center, and so we have to come back that he is who he says he is. And so I'm going to give you four quick ideas or four things here that hopefully prove this. And I, I try to construct it in a little bit of a chiastic way, which means... Uh, looks kind of like this, like an X, like in and out. And so we're going to see that Jesus is supreme because of who he is. He's supreme over creation, over the church, and then because of what he does. So we're going to kind of work in and out, hopefully following the text here. So the first thing is this. Christ is supreme because of who he is. Look what the text says. He is, right? Now he was, he will be, he might be. He is a statement of his nature, the image of the invisible God. So God, right, we know is invisible. He is a spirit. No one, John says, has seen God at any time. But the Son, who was in the bosom of the Father, he has come and explained him or revealed him. Why? Because Jesus is the exact representation of God himself. Because God cannot be physically seen, although at times he has manifested his presence, right, with a burning bush or the uh, the Spirit comes in the dove, or something like this, right? There are manifestations of God's presence to the physical senses of human beings. We cannot actually perceive Him, certainly not in His totality. To do so would be certain death. That's what He tells to Moses, right? You can't see my face, because if you do, you will die. And so what does He say? You can see the back of me. These are all accommodations to our human limitations. Because God is bigger than our ability to perceive he is the invisible God. That does not make him real. That just means that he's not perceptible normally to our physical senses. Which sometimes we make that mistake. We think that somehow the physical is the real and the invisible is the unreal. This is not the Bible's conception of the world. There are physical matter-driven things like our bodies and the world that we live in. There's also invisible immaterial, spiritual things that exist in, with, and all around those things, one of which is within us, our immaterial spirit. It gives our body its animation, its reality. Now we, as human beings, are made in God's image, but we are not ourselves the image. 
And that's an important distinction. We bear something true about God into the world. And there's a huge debate about what this means. I think a lot of it has to do with our ability, of course, to relate back to God. We have the ability to reason, to think, to worship, to love. But that's a participation in part of God's attributes that can be communicated to us. But we are not God ourselves, no matter what the world might say. Let me tell you how the world tells you that you're God. Believe in yourself. Look inside yourself for meaning. What does your heart tell you? You ever heard these things? Those are lies, okay? What you will find inside yourself is evil. Why? Well, Jeremiah tells us that the heart is deceptively wicked above all things. doesn't mean there's not some things about yourself that are true and good and right by God's grace. But the goal of life is not to look within to find meaning, to look within to find truth, your truth, whatever. It's to look beyond because you and I are not the image of God. Jesus is. If we want to find truth, if we want to find light and life and reality, then we look to the person who bears the image. He is himself God in the flesh. That is the practical effect of this statement here. Jesus is the image himself. An old commentator named John 80 says this, The lunar reflection is but a feeble resemblance of the solar glory. So he's saying, look, the moon reflects God's or the sun's nature just as we reflect God's nature, but the sun itself is hidden behind that reflection. It's not the the moon is not the sun actually. So he goes on to say, so that the image of God must be divine as well as visible, of the same essence with the original. A visible God can alone be the image of God, possessing all the elements and attributes of his nature. The divine can only be fully pictured in the divine. So for Jesus to be the image of God, he's not just a being, a powerful being. He is himself God in the flesh. And I cannot state to you how important this foundational piece of theology is. Because whatever we do with Jesus will direct everything else. Our theology, how we live on mission. We talked about this on Wednesday night. Most of the time, whenever people get off, they get off because they mess up who Jesus is. So we have to come back that he is none other than God in the flesh. The Word made flesh. Consider Hebrews 1. God, after He spoke long ago in the fathers and in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days He has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world. And He is the radiance of His glory, the exact representation of His nature, and upholds all things by the word of His power. When He made purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Sounds a lot like our passage, doesn't it? Because this is the Bible's teaching. That Jesus is none other than God himself. So not only is he the image of God. He is the firstborn of all creation. So this is what brings us to Christ being supreme over creation. So Jesus is that image of God, and because he's God, he has supremacy. But to prove that supremacy, Paul brings into this idea of he made everything. Therefore, he's Lord over everything. We recognize this in our culture through things like copyright law and patents. If you made it, you own it. In fact, isn't this what your mama used to say? I brought you into this world. That's exactly right. You made it, you own it. Sometimes when them little kids are running along like hoodlums, you're like, I don't know who made them. Wasn't me. If you made it, you own it. This is the Bible's point. Jesus made it. It's his. It exists for him. 
but he is supreme, number two, over all creation. So this is where the confusion also comes in. The firstborn of creation. Well, what does this mean? If, if he's firstborn, did he come into existence? And this neglects a whole host of biblical teaching on the matter and, quite frankly, what Paul is about to say in the next few words. The word firstborn here is not a matter of Jesus coming into existence because he is the image of God and therefore has existed before all things. But it's through him that creation comes to be. He is its first in rank, in priority. It's very similar, in fact, to what he tells the Jews in John chapter 8. They're all arguing about things that he's doing. He says, look, you're of your father the devil. And they're like, no, we know Abraham. He says, before Abraham was, I am. And they're all mad. So they pick up all these stones to stone him. Of course, he slips away. Because they know that what he has claimed is not just knowledge of God, not just relationship with God, but Godhead himself, that he is deity. And this is, of course, what Paul means, that through him all creation has come to be, like in John chapter 1. How do we know this? For by him all things were created. So if you are creating all things, then you have to not be a created thing. Otherwise, it's not all things. It's everything but one thing. All things. I think I've told you before about Dr. Fink. He used to say, all means all. And that's all all means. It should be that simple. That's all all means. Everything. Everything has come into being because of him. Notice, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. This is what we call merism, which is just a, a way to talk about the two ends of something and everything in between. We say it like this. I searched high and low, and I couldn't find it. What do we mean? We searched everywhere. We still couldn't find it. And we say things like, from the biggest to the smallest, the greatest, you know, so on and so forth. This is a way to express everything, whether it's in earth or in the heavens, whether it's visible or invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, these words seem to connect with perhaps some of the things that are being told to the Colossians about angels, right? Well, if you really want to be safe in this world, you've got to offer to this and worship that because angels were often ascribed physical, uh, to physical phenomenon. So there was a, a god of this and a god of uh, the thunder and a god of whatever. So all those things were made by him. Just in case you didn't get it the first time, all things have been created through him and for him. <clears throat> and so this is the nature of it. Creation came to be because Christ made it so. Now I want to make a, a brief comment here about kind of the way that we see this work out in Scripture. Because if we look back in Genesis, it just says, And God said... And there was, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void. And the Spirit of the Lord floated upon the face of the waters and so on and so forth. And so <clears throat> we don't get as much particularity in the narration of creation as we do in later biblical writing. It, the, the, the Lord, through his prophets and, and apostles, accumulates revelation that gives us a fuller and, and, and more clear picture over time. What we see in the scripture is that God, the Father, is this grand architect. He's the, the planner. But Jesus is like the foreman. He makes all the things happen, but you've got to have some power in there. And the Spirit, who is indeed a person, not just a force, is the one who brings animation to that. The same thing is true in our own salvation as well. We are saved by a Trinitarian God. God the Father has purpose to bring us out of the darkness into marvelous light or out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His Son. By how? The Son's work of redemption, which is applied to us by the indwelling and the presence of the Spirit. The same is true of creation. It is accomplished through Christ. He is the agent, the one who actually makes it to be. And then if we could look behind the text a little bit, it actually says all things through him and to him have been created. And so this all things gets fronted to the front, to the beginning, because it's trying to emphasize that. 
We don't really do this in English because our word order is much more governed. Unless it's in like songs or poems. Sometimes we switch the word order around. This is kind of what Paul is doing. He's saying, look, everything, everything, everything is Jesus's. He owns it. It has his stamp on it. As 80 says again, As no atom is too minute, so no creature is too gigantic for his plastic hand. In fact, do you remember that little children's song? You know what it is? He's got the whole world in his hands. See, joyful noise, I told you. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. But do we believe that? I wonder. Because what happens when someone we love dies and we say, God, what are you doing? What happens when our kids go off to college or drive away in the car the first time? We're worried. What happens when the world is consumed in a pandemic, and we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, we're afraid. You see, the fact that Jesus does indeed have the whole world in his hands is not merely a theological statement to be studied. It's a true proposition to be believed and trusted. If Jesus doesn't have the whole world in his hands, then you and I should be afraid. We should be worried. Because what else would we have? Remember, Peter says, Jesus asked Peter, well, who do you guys say that I am? And Peter says, well, you're the Christ. Where else will we go, Lord? You see, that's the fundamental question of all humanity. Either Jesus is who he says he is, and I should run to him. Or he's a liar, and all of this is a bunch of baloney. But you tell me, has Jesus proven to you that he's got the whole world in his hands? I mean, he died on the cross to give you life and hope and a future If that doesn't prove that Jesus is who he says he is, then nothing will. So he's got that whole world in his hands. Not only did Jesus make it, you get this idea that he made it in a hands-on sort of way. I think this is what is beautiful about Genesis chapter 2. In fact, what I would argue for you is that Jesus, well, Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is actually there in the dirt making the man. And then later he comes and takes the rib and fashions it into a woman. So God the Father has declared that creation will be and has spoken. Let there be and Jesus does. And he makes everything like a potter makes pottery from clay. So Jesus not only owns it, but he loves it. He cares for it. So much so that he holds it up. So creation is upheld by Christ. We saw that in Hebrews three or Hebrews one, one through three. But we see it here as well. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. As I said, the only reason that you and I can sit here this morning is because Jesus makes it to be so. In fact, the tense of the verb here is one that is a past action with a present enduring reality. We we say things like this. Well, I am married. I was married at a point in the past, but I'm still married. That's a stative. So this is the case here. Things are upheld. Jesus made it and he keeps it. Now I want to take a a brief aside here for just a, a second. Because the major attack against the doctrine of Jesus' creation 
It's taught to our kids every day in school and narrated for us every day on the news or in our devices. It's this idea that the world came to be by chance, right? By some big bang or some other thing, and then everything slowly developed through evolution. Friend, this is untrue. God made everything. It's as simple as that. If we miss that, then a whole host of other things fall out of place. If God didn't make us, then what claim does he have over us? If God didn't make us, is he even real? You see, all these things hold together. This is why every time like our kids will come home, they'll read a book uh, you know, that some secular scientist or something has written, and it'll say, you know, so-and-so thing developed, and da 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 We were reading about pandas the other day. And I said, well, they didn't develop, did they? And they said, no. And I'm like, you guys got it. They were made. Now, that doesn't mean there's not small changes that things adapt to over time. That certainly happens. But things are made in their kind according to the way that God intended them to be. So we have to understand that Jesus truly is supreme over creation. But not over only creation that's natural, but over supernatural creation. His church. What does it say here? He is also the head of the body, the church. This seems like a strange thing to put if he's talking about creation. Now why is he in the church? But you've got to remember, the church is the beginning of the recreation of all things. Now he says in Romans 8 that the world is waiting on the revelation of the sons of God because it groans under the curse that was brought about by sin. And so now that the church has come and redemption has invaded into time and space, it is that promise, that bulkhead that will eventually broaden out into everything else. So not only is what was originally made Christ, so what is newly made is Jesus. He is the head of the body, the church. What this means is the church doesn't belong to you and me. It's not the only thing it means, but it at least means that. But sometimes we get confused. And sometimes we say things like, well, my church, and we don't mean like the church I go to, the church where I attend, or the church where I serve. We usually say that because the church is not doing thing, the way things I want them to be done. Or we say things like, we always. Here's the way it works in church. If you do something once, you always did it. You're like, friend, we only did that one time. We always did it that way. No, we didn't. Now, there are some things that we should always do certain ways. But like I told you last time, what we often forget is that what we're doing in the church is trying to build people, not programs. And it's really easy as people to forget that. Programs and opportunities and ministry things, all those are avenues for the church to engage in evangelism and discipleship and worship to God, not so we can get stuck in ruts. You ever notice that? Like some people, whenever they mow their lawn, they do the same way over and over. And then when you ride by, you're like, that looks weird because they have ruts. We don't want the church to be like that. We want it to be solid. We want it to keep the things that are necessary and true and good. But we also want it to be big enough and diverse enough and malleable enough to follow the head wherever he goes. We don't want to be lame. So Christ is the head. This is his church. It's not my church. It's not your church. You belong to it because you belong to Jesus. But if you come and you're upset because someone sat in your pew or parked in your space or ate the muffin that you wanted at breakfast, then you missed it. You see, when we come to church, to this place, and we worship with these people, and we leave thinking, I didn't like that song, it was too cold, it was too hot, why'd the preacher preach so long? All we demonstrated 
is that we didn't come to church for Jesus. We came to church for me. But the last time I checked, it didn't say Chase Henson is the head of the body. Christ is the head, and we are the body. We must follow Him. Now, of course, this metaphor for the body is one that's used prolifically in Scripture. Sometimes it's used to talk about the living nature of the parts, how all the parts work together. Here, it's really more talking about the source. Jesus Christ is the thing that gives life to the body. But I think there are a couple of things that we can note here. First is this. A body is a unified whole. All the parts fit together. There are no accidental parts. Right? No matter what, like I said, evolution will tell you, right? You don't have vestigial origin, organs. You have all the necessary ones. So you're not accidental. Your placement in our body is not accidental. Jesus made it that way. Everyone is needed. No one should be left out. And we have to have unity in that regard, moving in the same direction, doing the same thing from the direction of the head. But also, we have a dependence on Christ. Without Christ, there would be no church. That's why I've told you before that this is not a social club. It's a church. But also, we have a relation to obey the head, to make His will visible in the world. So this brings us to this last point here, which is Christ is supreme because of what he has done. So he's supreme because of who he is. He's supreme over creation, over the church. And this is demonstrated practically in what he has done. Look what it says. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. So Christ came to earth as the God-man, God and man in one. And in that, he reconciles all things to God. Now this has been historically used to point out that Jesus is some kind of universalist, that everybody's going to be saved. This is not the point. What he's saying is everything will eventually come into its right place. We sang a song about it. Either we can worship Christ now and have the better thing, or we will bow before him in subjection later. But all things will have their proper place in Christ. But we can have peace between God and man if we trust in Him, having made peace through the blood of the cross. So if we trust in Christ and His work on the cross, then we will be brought into a loving relationship with God, one that brings life and hope and happiness. And of course, this happens, as I said, by the cross. I want to give you four statements as we close here as a way to apply this. The first is this. Because Christ is supreme, He is worthy of faith. What I mean, friend, if this is who Christ is and what He came to do, then you have a command. This is what Paul says in Acts chapter 17. All men everywhere must repent. You ever thought about that? That the gospel is a command? It is one we can deny. But it is for our good. If you're here today, friend, or listening online, and you don't know Jesus, the most important thing that you could do is to bow your knees before the supreme of the universe. Throw yourself upon His mercy. He will rescue you. Because Christ is supreme, He is worthy of faith. But He is also worthy of worship. You see, Paul is quite clear that the only person that we should worship is God Himself, Christ Himself, because of who He is and what He has done. Sometimes we get so caught up in other things in our own preferences, in the things that we'd rather be doing. But friend, Christ is worthy of worship. Thirdly, because Christ is supreme, He is worthy of ongoing trust. We can trust Him for His provision. We can trust Him for His protection. We can trust His plan. 
even when we don't see what it is. It means we don't have to fear. We don't have to worry. We only have to walk with Him. And lastly this, because Christ is supreme, He is worthy of total obedience. But I wonder if we're more content to give Him partial obedience. I mean, is He first place in our families, in our marriages, in our vocations, in our missions, in our ministry, in how we think, how we use our time, how we love one another, how we talk to one another, in our pleasures, in our eating, in our play, in our recreation, what we watch on television or the internet, how we consume art and music. Is he first or not? There's a song, I know you know it well, It's called, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. It says, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to His blood. See from His head, His hands, His feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? And then listen to this. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Friend, I am purposed as your pastor to do everything within my power to make Christ the center of our church. And how we read the scripture and the things that we do and how we worship. But I cannot do that if you do not similarly purpose to make Christ everything in your heart. I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment.